ask you to help us to be uh, good students of your word. I do pray that you'd help us to understand uh, this, uh, help us to admire your words. And the more we uh, study them, uh, the more uh, I sort of kind of feel like I don't know them. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to see that you are infinite in your understanding. And I just pray that you'd help us to love your words and believe uh, what you give us the faith to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> see the title of the letter, the general, the general epistle of Jude. So that uh, began <clears throat> to be put on the titles. Who chose that? I don't know. I suppose God did. Guided the men to do this. Uh, it is in the 1611. Oops, it's not there. Uh, I do have that replica at both churches, that great big pulpit Bible, and it has it in there. And James is the first time it's found. Okay, James is the uh, equivalent of the word Jacob. Uh, Moses and I was talking about that this morning. Not Moses in the Old Testament, but the one back here. Where many of the Spanish Bibles have uh, the Epistle of Santiago, but the uh, 1602 Purified has it, uh, the Epistle of, how do you say that? Jacobo? Jacobo? Jacob? Jacob? Hobble. Okay, there you go. He got it. Speaking in tongues. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, so that's James. So, in Galatians 2, verse 9, it's a passage we need to kind of keep in mind. There was a meeting between Paul and Barnabas. So this took place before Acts 15, because remember, Paul and Barnabas had a falling out in Acts 15. And with uh, James, Peter, and John, so they had those five in this meeting, and they concluded... James, Peter, and John, they will continue to be apostles to circumcision, to the Jews. And then Paul and Barnabas, and then later Silas, after the split, and Timothy, were uh, ministering to the Gentiles. So that's Galatians 2.9. So we keep that in mind. <clears throat> then uh, that was one of, that was actually, uh, Galatians was the first epistle that Paul uh, wrote. He actually wrote that one by hand, according to the last couple passages or verses in there. So that, that lays a foundation. So then when you go to Hebrews, we can see that it clearly says Hebrews. Sadly, I, I even hear a bunch of Bible believers say that's Hebrew Christians. And no, it's not. It, it says Hebrews. And uh, not that we, can't, we can still get something out of it, but doctrinally it's for Hebrews of the last days. And then James... So he had to write his epistle before Acts 12 because he was martyred in Acts 12. So you'll see in James, there's, there doesn't seem to be any hint or understanding of Acts 15 where they concluded we're saved by grace. So there's no hint of that in James. And then you have First and Second Peter. And it will say general epistle. James will say general epistle. Second Peter says general epistle. First John says general epistle. Second and third John do not. But then we have it here in Jude. So who is this guy? Who is this Jude? If you would uh, try. Oh, let's see. Luke. Let's go to Luke. Uh, chapter 6. Now almost all of the commentators... Almost all of them, uh, good and bad and like, <clears throat> seem to think that Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. And they seem to think that the epistle of James is a half-brother of Jesus. Uh, and I, I'm not settled with that. I would say, logically, James is the apostle. And Jude is the apostle. So if you have in Luke uh, 6, verse 16... You, go, you can go also to Mark and to the cross-reference to Matthew. You'll see that these men have multiple names just like you and I do. Okay, in Jude 6, I'm sorry, Luke, hopefully I said that. Luke 6.13, you see, he, uh, he said he called on him his disciples. So there were 70 of them at one time, according to John 6. 
And then of the 70, he chose 12. And they, then called them apostles. And what came with that title is uh, apostolic signs so that, that accompanied that. Okay, and one of those 12, remember, was Judas Iscariot, a devil, a literal devil. And then the first one is Simon, but he's also called Peter. And then he's also called Cephas in another place. So you have Simon, Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Now, if you go to John, uh, you'll find that Andrew came to Jesus first. And then he went and found his brother. And that's the best way truth is spread. Family with family, family and friends. So first it was Andrew said, we've heard of him called the Messiah to Pete. And then Pete, he brought Peter to Jesus. So just think Andrew gets a little bit of credit for all Peter's efforts. And then Peter became the chief spokesman. And then uh, Nathaniel, okay, then Nathaniel and Philip was in John 1. Philip went and found Nathaniel. Now, it doesn't say they're brothers. It must be friends. So then, then he came to Jesus. So that, that's the, the best way or the surest way of spreading the word. So you have Simon, verse 14, Andrew, James, and John. Now, those are brothers. Philip, I think that's the guy in Acts 8. Bartholomew. Matthew. And Thomas, of course, everybody knows Thomas, and probably what came to mind is, okay, you know, the poor guy, just not going to get out of that one. Okay, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotus. Okay, that's another guy. Now, Zelotus or Zealot, this would have been the patriot types of the day. They would have said, we're not to be under Rome, we're to be our own sovereign nation, blah, blah, blah. So that would have been Simon and Zelotus. Judas, the brother of James. So that's the James of verse 5. So you got two brothers there. Now that, that James, the son of Alphaeus, Matthew in the cross reference is also called the son of Alphaeus. So I don't know if it's the same guy. If it is, you have two sets of two brothers and then one set of three brothers if that's the same man. So the, the, kind of keep it in family. And then verse 16, Judas, the brother of James. So that would be Jude of the epistle. That's, that's, that's where I'm hanging my hat. And then Judas of Carrot, of course. Okay, then if you go to Acts 1. Acts 1, 13. There they are again. So in Acts 1.13, you got Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, the Zealot, Zealot, Zelotus, Judas, brother of James. And notice they're, they're obviously skipping Judas Iscariot. Now, I don't know if this was directed by the Lord, but they chose to pick a replacement. That's down in verse 23. A guy named Joseph. Well, a lot of Josephs associated with Jesus and a lot of Marys. Okay, called Barsabbas and was surnamed Justice. So that guy had three names. Okay, so surname in our culture, surname is your last name. And your first two names, or if you got two names, is your Christian name. Maybe three names. Okay, and so that's our customs, how that works. And then Matthias. And of course, they did a spiritual thing as they cast lots or threw dice or, you know, picked a straw or flipped a coin. And if, if you, you know, you, if, if there's a way you don't know and either way is okay, there's nothing wrong with flipping a coin. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's just that we can't go two out of three or three out of four until we get what we want. So, uh, so that's, that's who I'm going to hang my hat on who's going to be the writer is Jude the Apostle. Therefore, uh, this will have very strong Jewish connotations. And most likely Jewish connotations for the Jewish people of the tribulation time period. And as I mentioned this morning, how the Bible is like a circle. 
okay, or a spiral where you come around. So you have tree of life at the beginning and you come all the way around to Revelation 22 and there it is again, tree of life. So it's, maybe it's like a spiral where it keeps coming around like this, but a tree of life. So here we have something way in the back of the Bible. And if you drop down to verse 6, he goes to the front of the Bible for an illustration. Verse 7, so verse 6 is Genesis 6. Verse 7 is Genesis 19. And then the invasion of the body snatchers in verse 10, 9. That's Deuteronomy 34. So those are all, those three, sex, three passages are all under what the Jewish people call the law. And we would call the same thing, Pentateuch or whatever. So he's going back there. And then if you go to verse 11, he goes to Balaam, he goes to Korah, he goes to Cain, Cain, Genesis 4, Balaam, Numbers 22 to 25, Korah, Numbers 16. So he's going to all that. And then verse 14, Enoch. So the so-called book of Enoch that's floating around where a lot of people think that that should be in the Bible. When they can't even figure out the 66, let alone 67, 68, 69, 70, you know, book of Judith, you know, and Jasher and all those things. Uh, there is one sentence out of Enoch that was put in the Bible. If there was a book written by him, maybe there was, but Mo, uh, Noah would have had to get it on the boat. So in verse 14, 15, you have Enoch. So that's Genesis 5. So this is covering a lot of things out of the Old Testament because he's dealing with the Jewish people. And then uh, I saw apostles over there in verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken by before of the holy apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this, this has very, very strong um, general description of apostasy and spiritism of the last days. So this will give understanding to the Jewish people. The tribulation is going to be the most wild scene where you're going to have angels kicked out of heaven, going to come to earth. The devil is going to be kicked out of heaven, come to earth. And you've got good angels flying around, going from place to place, having all these apparitions. It's going to be a wild scene. It's just going to be, the Lord is just going to let everything go during this time. The spiritual world, the invisible world, is going to manifest itself in the visible world. And people's brains are going to be fried half the time. And they're going to be on drugs trying to overcome all this bizarre things that they're going to see. And so this is, this is why this is written. And you'll see in verse 7, it's not an understatement. Or I guess it, we would think it's an understatement when you go down about uh, two-thirds into the verse. Strange flesh. Weird flesh. Unusual flesh. And thank God, most of us, I'd say most all of us, have been sheltered from these things. Thank the Lord that, you know, I was raised, you know, an introvert, you know, on a farm, sheltered. But the Lord has allowed some people that has had weird experiences cross my path. And I just listened to them. I mean, Bill Sneblin's one of those. And here we're in Australia talking to a man, and, and he's telling us his stories, and it's kind of similar to Bill's. And then there's another woman, and it's like the Lord just had these people cross my path, and I learned some things from them, from them, not that I had to learn it myself, personally. I can't imagine the, you know, these people, they, they suffer from PTSD, you know, from all that stuff. I just can't imagine how they overcome it. Now, in Bill's case, Neblin's case, his was, his was a choice where the fellow in Australia was, his was raised in a family, and they were still watching him to the day when we talked to him. And, that's, and he said his story paralleled another lady, a lady's story in, in Australia who came out in 2015 revealing to the police what a, that her Nazi grandparents did to her and, and where and the places and names and dates and, and the sacrifices. And when uh, I asked this gentleman about her, he said, my story is very similar to hers. 
And I described to him Bill Sneblin without naming Bill. And he said, you're talking about Bill Sneblin. And then he gave us an envelope to bring to America so we could mail it to Bill from America so that the people back there did not know that he was sending this letter. I mean, that's bizarre. That's bizarre things. And so people of the tribulation are going to see these things. So Jude is going to write about it. He's just going to give a sentence. Okay, like in verse 6, he just gives one sentence about Genesis 6. That's all he does. Then he expects the reader to go back to Genesis 6 and figure it out. Then in verse 7, he just gives one sentence about Sodom, Gomorrah. And then he expects the reader to go back to Genesis and read about that. And then you, you try to discern um, some ideas going through there. So this, uh, this is going to be some bizarre things. And of course, Jesus said twice... He said it. Uh, he said, as it was in the days of Noah. So you go back to Genesis 6. We're reading Genesis 6. We're reading about the past, but it's also the future at the same time. And then in Luke, he says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So when we go back to Genesis 18 and 19 and read that, we're reading about the past, but we're also reading about the future. And this is why... The transgender movement, I mean, if you would have told me about the transgender movement 10 years ago, who, who would have us believed that? 10 years ago, that's how exponential it's been accelerating. Okay, and in Thailand, my, my nephew Josh says, in Thailand, the prettiest girls on the streets are boys. Because that, that country, for some reason, kind of specializes in that. And so, who I would have never dreamed of that, you know, just 10, 15 years ago. I thought, back then, the sodomy was the last straw. But it's even worse than that. It's even worse. And, and, and of course, you see in this stuff nowadays, what the public schools are allowing and promoting and the leftist, the leftist agenda. If they would have promoted what they're promoting today, like drag queens in libraries, 10 years ago, the average country folks would have lynched them. And now they're afraid to. So uh, this is what Jude is, is, is writing about. OK, and uh, he's uh, putting a lot of, quite a bit of stuff in here. OK, so, OK, that's pretty much for the foundation. So we'll start in verse one. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. OK, the idea of being a servant, if you would go back to Leviticus 25, <clears throat> the book of Levi, Leviticus, it's like the handbook for the Old Testament Levites. And they were the custodians of the scriptures. That's who God chose to uh, write, to handwrite the scriptures out, to keep them preserved. And Ezra is one of those characters, Ezra chapter 7. He, he was called a ready scribe. He's ready, rough and ready. He was ready to go. He was excited about it. Can you imagine writing out? The Bible, every single, you know, scriptures every single day. Now, it, it took Jan three years, three and a half years to write out the entire Bible. Now, she wrote it out from Genesis all the way through. I would have taken a new translation because they have less words. But, <laughs> but and she's, she's kept all that. And uh, it took me three and a half years to start in Genesis and come all the way through the reference Bible. But, you know, I was cheating. I had... All this other stuff. To hand write it out is something. But that's what the scribes did. That's what the Levites did. Ezra is one of those characters. But when you get into the New Testament, in the book of Acts, as you transition through, remember that one guy named Barnabas was a Levite? He was the one that discipled Paul. And he, got, he did not get any special attention because that priesthood changed. So this is the doctrine of the Baptist uh, persuasion of what's called the priesthood of the believer. And that's, that's, that's right. We're each, thank God we don't have to go to a guy in a telephone booth 
to confess our sins. You know, they, I wonder if they run specials. You only have five Hail Marys this week for cussing out a Protestant, you know. You know, I, you know all that stuff. And can you imagine just sitting in there and confess? And that's, that's how they blackmailed people in the 1800s. That's how the, the Roman church blackmailed a lot of their people. That's supposed to be confidential information unless a woman steals from the offering plate in the Catholic Church when she was a secretary. Then he went to the police and she got arrested. That's supposed to be confidential. (laughs) So, boy, praise the Lord. We can go right to the Lord. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So, yeah, that's that's true. You know, several years ago, Bill Day went through bankruptcy, and we had to go to South Bend for his bankruptcy hearing. And uh, I gave him two Bibles, and that rascal didn't pay for them. So that made me a creditor. And we had several of this. Ronnie gave him some gasoline. He didn't pay for that. So that made us creditors in his bankruptcy. And that's really kind of a fun experience. So we were there for as friendly creditors for Bill. And since we're in South Bend area, I thought it'd be a good idea because I, ha- I at that time I had one of them black collars with the white. And I thought, it, hey, that might work over there. So I went over there with that. My brother was a little nervous because he said, you're not a father. I said, oh, yeah, I am. I got several kids. He said, you're not a priest. I said, oh, yeah, I am. Priesthood of the believer. I'm covered. And it's easy to pass out why is Mary crying tracks with that collar on. Oh, man, is it easy. You just hand it a bless you, my child, and just take that home and read that. And so here we're in this thing, and, you know, you, you can uh, post it. And there's the U.S. attorney, and there's the attorney that was against Bill. And so and then they ask if anybody had, at the end, they ask if anybody had any questions or statements. And I say, yeah, I'd like to say something. Yes, Father. And I said, I don't trust that man up in the front because the Bible says, Jesus said, woe unto you lawyers for you take away the key of knowledge. (laughs) And the U.S. attorney's eyebrows went up and he said, well, that really doesn't fly here. I said, I knew I didn't, but I just wanted to say it. And then we all left. And so I didn't know any of the other creditors. That's how we came in. We don't know you. I don't know you. I didn't even know my brother. And so it was a fun experience. You know how that works. But even at that, uh, thank God that we don't have the priesthood uh, of the Israelites anymore. Leviticus 25, verse 55. Leviticus 25, 55. God chose Israel to be his servants. Now, with that choosing came obligations and blessings. To whom much is given, much is required. So Leviticus 25, 55 for unto me the, the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. All that to say, when Jude says that, the servant of Jesus Christ, that's why you'd have to, you'd have to go with that as far as the uh, Jewish designation. James, he says, James, a servant of God. Now, I know Paul said that also. We're a servant of Jesus Christ. I think a servant is slightly different than a slave. Uh, I, for a long time, I thought they were the same. But the word slave is only found two times in the Bible. One in a singular, one in a plural. And it's in Jer- Jeremiah 2.19 where he says a, ser- a homebound servant and a slave or something like that. So a servant and a slave are used in the same verse. So I'm thinking that there must be a slight variation since he's using both words in the same verse. Where a servant is how we use the word employee. And I think the difference is a servant has an opportunity for liberty. A slave has no opportunity. And slavery, people don't know it in our history, the the, um, Irish were sold as slaves in America. There were many whites sold as slaves in America. And that, that's a covered up history in our culture. And 
The Roman church has had slaves for years and will continue to have slaves. You'll find the last time the word slave is, the only time in the New Testament is Revelation 18, verse 21. And it talks about mystery, Babylon the Great, and one of theirs is trafficking of people, and they're called slaves. So, and of course, the Muslims, they're, they're well known for slavery. That hasn't changed at all with the Muslim people. So this is, this is just a deception in America to separate the races, to get people to fight with each other. And while they're fighting with each other, they don't see the fraud that the ones at the top are perpetrating against them. So uh, that, that's the thing that's happening in our country. So when Jude says he's a servant of Jesus Christ, that, that's quite a statement for an Israelite to be a you know, mess- Messianic Jew. So Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, and might be the brother of Matthew, I'm not sure, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. So now he has fully understood the Godhead, where they didn't know this, under the Jewish culture, sanctified by God the Father. And when he's using the word sanctified, he's probably running back to Exodus 12 and 13, where they sanctified and set apart the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. And then he sanctified many of the uh, implements in the Jewish temple, set them apart, sanctified by God, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, he adds an additional word where Paul, in his letters, starts off with grace and peace in all of his letters. With, Peter, or with Timothy and Titus, he, he adds mercy. But Jude, he starts off with mercy because these poor people of the tribulation are going to need the mercy of God. They're going to be desperate in need of that. And then he offers them grace, both of mercy and grace. In Hebrews 4.16, mercy is not receiving what you deserve. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. So mercy is like the negative aspect. I'm not going to hell. That's God's mercy. Grace is the positive aspect. I get to go to heaven. That's grace. So he says to these people, People, these recipients of this letter, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied because they're going to need it for the dramatic events, the mind blowing events that they're going to witness. When he says that even if a man comes to you, entertain that man because he might be an angel. You just don't know. In Hebrews 13, and then he says, Remember them who are in bonds as bound with them. So that would be the ones imprisoned. And that's why Jesus will say that if you visit someone in prison at the judgment of the nations, because those people will be imprisoned. If you would, try Psalm 79. Psalm 79. Remember the Psalms uh, will jump most of the time into the second coming or tribulation time period. Many of these songs are that way. 79.1, O God, the heathen are coming to thine inheritance. So a cross reference there would be Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Historically, that's what Lamentations is written about. Doctrinally, it's jumping into the trib. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there's none to bury them. Okay, so Lamentations writes about what um, Jeremiah witnessed, but this is jumping further into the tribulation. How do we know that? Verse 5. How long, O Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? That's the anger of God against Israel, the wrath of the Lamb of the tribulation. Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? 
And what are they going? How, how? What are these people going to be doing? Verse eleven. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee, where they're sitting in in prison. And they're saying, Lord, how long? How long, Lord? How long? How long are we going to be doing this? And the Lord will say, Not much longer. Not much longer. So that's the sighing of the prisoner, the sighing, and I'm sure crying too. But he uses sighing here. So this is why Jude would start it off, mercy, may God have mercy. And may God grant you peace. And he says that Jesus said that in that uh, Olivet Discourse, or as he's walking with the apostles in John 14, he said, the peace I give you is not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And then he tells them in Luke 12, now when they bring you before magistrates and when they bring you before synagogues, don't worry about it. Don't be upset. Don't, don't. Uh, he said, I'm going to, the Holy Ghost is going to give you the words to say. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to be set free. Because those words will be used to to expose the magistrate, his hypocrisy, and see what they do. But still, the idea is that he said, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have the Spirit of God's going to say these things through you. Luke, uh, that's Luke 12, 11, and 12. So the peace. And then love. Love, the necess- necessity of love is because so many other believers will probably fall by the wayside or will be tempted to fall by the wayside and you've got to love them in spite of it. You see, a lot of times people are impatient and they lack grace towards someone who grew up in the ranks where they want to go test the waters. Okay? And you pray that they don't, but when they do, you love them. You love them. Okay, and so mercy unto you and peace and love. And notice multiplied, not added, multiplied, (laughs) exponential. You need this. And then uh, one more place, if you would go back to Hebrews 4, 6. Boy, we have the great promise of the mystery of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Hebrews 4, verse 16. So he says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may get that Cadillac that we prayed for, (laughs) that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That, That... Find grace, those two words, find and found grace. 20, I think over 30 times, find grace 10 times, found grace 20 some times. All in the Old Testament, this is the only time in the New Testament, Noah found grace in the eye of the Lord. In the Old Testament, a person finds grace. In the New Testament, grace finds grace. You now, I don't want to, that sounds Calvinist, but still the idea there is that grace finds us, except for this is the only occurrence in the New Testament, and it makes perfect sense. It's in Hebrews because it's picking up Old Testament doctrine. So the Bible is such an amazing book. Okay, we'll stop there and pray. Lord, I do thank you for your words, and I do pray that you'd help us to be uh, continual students of your word. We might, uh, it might become clear, and we might be uh, rightly divide the word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen.